Welcome to the Simple Faith Podcast, exploring authentic Christianity for normal people. My name is Dave Betts, and together with my wife, Sherea, we're going to explore all the things that make our faith what it is. From looking at the big picture of the Bible to exploring the tough questions that might be getting in the way of your relationship with God. We're not going to use unnecessarily churchy language, and we're not pretending that we have all the answers. And the best bit, we'll never take more than 30 minutes of your time each week. We want to keep it simple and hopefully have some fun along the way. Thanks for joining us. This week, we're starting the first of a three-part series looking at the church and LGBT. Welcome back to the Simple Faith Podcast. Uh, This show is going to look a little different over the next three weeks as we discuss a topic that we want to take very, very seriously. Uh, We're going to be talking about the church and LGBT. And we know that for many people, this is a hugely sensitive subject. So we want to handle it cautiously, uh, carefully, and as kindly as possible. We know that it's a topic that has been like just horrendously mishandled in the last few decades, as as we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, It's something that that I've been intensely studying, researching, interviewing, and uh, praying about for well over a year now, uh, long before this podcast was was ever a thing. Uh, we want to do our very best to get it right, and we are praying that we do. And my role in the next few weeks is primarily to ask questions, as I'm still very much learning on this too. Remember that this podcast is about authentic Christianity for normal people. We don't have all the answers, but we don't want to shy away from these difficult conversations either. Yeah, this is not going to be your average discussion around LGBT. Uh, Over the next three episodes, we're going to take what might seem like a a kind of a winding road, but I'm convinced, we're convinced that of all the topics where shortcuts are not okay, this is one of them. So the aim of the series is, is this, is to have a robust, open, vulnerable conversation about the church and LGBT. Uh, Notice uh, something really important there, that the the church is first in that title. Because you might be thinking, well, what gives you guys, a, a heterosexual married couple, the authority to speak about LGBT? In fact, we've had that question before. Well, our, our, our objective is not primarily to address people who would consider themselves part of the LGBT community. Although, if that describes you, we're, we're praying hard that this would be beneficial to you. Our, our objective instead is to speak to the church about its relationship to the LGBT community. You see, what what tends to happen is that people often throw aside or manipulate the Bible in in the name of love, or they coldly and kind of callously like spew Bible verses or say stupid things like Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, in the name of of truth. And as Bible-believing Christians, both are wrong, but we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So kind of let's let's get back to that winding road idea. Sherea, do you want to walk us through the plan for the next three weeks? Yeah, for sure. So this week, we're going to define a few terms, discuss where the church has gone wrong on LGBT in the past, and establish some crucial biblical foundations. And the next week, we're going to talk about sexual intimacy, singleness, and marriage. And when all those things are firmly in place, that will enable us to have a constructive conversation around the church and LGBT. We believe that each step in this conversation is crucial. That's right. So with all that in mind, let's just establish a few very important things. uh, And then uh, we need to pray. Uh, Firstly, we're not talking about theological doctrine alone. This is not an argument to win. Uh, We are talking about people who deserve as much love as anybody else. Secondly, we humbly submit these thoughts to you in what, July 2020 with the full knowledge that there will be some of you on both sides of the discussion who are going to disagree with our conclusions. And one of the, the biggest lies I think we often find ourselves believing is that you can only love someone if you agree with them. That is categorically false. We can disagree and still love each other well. And if that's the case over the next few weeks that you you disagree with us, well, can I ask that we pursue unity in in disagreement and 
robust, prayerful, Christ-centered discussion together uh, with with love. And with, with that all said, I'm going to pray. I know we don't normally pray on the show, but I think this is important, and I, I hope you'll pray with me too. Father, thank you for the wonder of the gospel. Thank you that though we are all broken, sinful humans and deserve eternal separation from your holy presence, you sent your son, Jesus, to take the punishment that we deserved. And because of that undeserved love and grace that was poured upon us through his death, resurrection, ascension, we can enjoy your presence forever. And it, as, we, as we grapple with our response to the LGBT community, would you, by your spirit, enable us to see the individuals behind uh, this theology? Help us to love outrageously, but, but stand for your truth courageously. Remove any holier-than-thou or judgmental attitudes from me or from us as we, so without your grace, we would be slaves to our own sinful tendencies. We lay this in your hands and use us for your glory, we, we pray. Amen. Okay, so before we get going here, let's define some terms. We need to make sure that we are all on the same page because I think there's a lot of confusion here. So what does LGBT stand for, Sherea? Okay, so LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. These are the main terms that we're going to look at for the next few weeks, but it's worth knowing that LGBT can also have fuller definitions, such as LGBT 2QQIAAP, or LGBT2Q+. Um, and just last week, Dave, you mentioned you saw a different definition on the news. Um, I think you said it was 2SLGBTQ+. Yeah, it, it sounds really confusing for those of us who perhaps haven't had a huge amount of experience in the LGBT arena. Uh, but those fuller definitions basically include things like two-spirit, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, agender, pansexual. There's a, there's a lot. Uh, but for the purposes of this discussion, as you said, Sherea, we're going to focus on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. So let's talk about the word homosexual or gay for a second. Did you know that these words are, are really actually pretty modern words? They didn't join our vocabulary until around the last two centuries or so. So right from the outset, we need to be careful with using them in relation to the Bible. Uh, traditionally, these words refer to people who are either attracted to or actively engaged in sexual relationships with members of the same sex. But this is challenging for a number of reasons. I want to read a quote by a guy called Preston Sprinkle, who wrote a book called People to be Loved that I highly recommend. Uh, he says this, when we say homosexuality, what exactly do we mean? Uh, those who are married to someone of the same sex, someone who is having same-sex intercourse, someone who is attracted to the same sex. If so, how much attraction on a scale of one to 10 qualifies one to be included in your concept of homosexuality? A four, a six, an eight? Homosexuality, as you can see, is a broad term that has potential of erasing the faces of real people with different stories. Uh, we think he raises a really good point here. And because of this, we're going to differentiate between uh, same-sex attraction and same-sex behavior, unless perhaps uh, we're referring to, to both, I guess. And this will be really important once we get to the later parts of this discussion uh, in later episodes. And, and by the way, I, I want to mention as well that uh, when I asked a friend of mine who would describe himself as a gay Christian, because I want to be clear, we have asked our friends, we've talked to our friends who would experience same-sex attraction. Uh, when I asked what he thought about the terms same-sex attraction and same-sex behavior, he uh, really respectfully disagreed with them. As he said, he found them kind of patronizing. But on the other hand, uh, it's important to say that he recognized the challenge and, and the requirement to differentiate between uh, attraction and behavior, given the broadness of the word 
gay. So we're going to use those terms for now, same-sex attraction and same-sex behavior, but we know that they are, are less than perfect. It's, it's the best that we think we've got right now. So of course, same-sex attraction and behavior will refer to uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual. So that's three of the four uh, letters in the acronym LGBT. But what do we mean when we talk about transgender and intersex, Sharia? One definition of transgender describes it as relating to a person whose gender identity does not correspond to that person's biological sex assigned at birth. Notice that many in the LGBT community would consider biological sex as physical, but a sense of gender as what you truly feel you are. An intersex is something slightly different. The Intersex Society of North America defines intersex as a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definition of female or male. So the distinction between transgender and intersex is really important, but we'll talk about that more in the later series, right? We certainly will. So those are some key definitions. And you might know those already, and that's great. But And if you're listening to this on a walk or a bike ride or in the car or some other place where you can't take notes, don't forget that you can find show notes at uh, simplefaithpodcast.com and we'll include some of those definitions. In fact, because this is so important, we're going to include uh, a, as close a transcript to this whole thing as possible so you can go back and read it. Uh, we don't normally do that, but we feel that this is a topic that's important enough to, to do that for. So this is a big question, Sharia. Where has the church gone wrong in the LGBT arena? <laughs> well, where do we start? Yeah, exactly. Um, the church has not done an ideal job on this. In fact, I would say that the, the global church has done a spectacularly poor job on this in the last century. Like Too many Christians have swung that kind of big old pendulum to the most extreme points, as we kind of alluded to earlier. They've either treated it as an argument to be won or maybe an illness to be cured and forgotten the real people being discussed in the process, or they've swung to the other end of the spectrum, compromising on biblical truth for the sake of inclusivity at all costs and I've seen both. In fact, I've probably been guilty of both in my uh, just over a decade of my Christian faith. In Rachel Gilson's book, Born Again This Way, she reminds us of an uncomfortable truth. Listen to this. Parts of the church have historically been a source of pain and mistreatment for gay and lesbian people, trafficking in stereotypes, cruel jokes, and in some cases, physical violence. Even today, there are youth who are trying to understand their sexuality in the light of the gospel who are being kicked out of their homes or having their inheritances or money for college held in ransom. I'm sure we recognize this picture and it's not a good one. I've met many, many people who would vehemently and openly condemn same-sex behavior and yet would hypocritically turn a blind eye to drunkenness, to greed, to, to gossip, to lust, and to anger in the lives of others. And on the other hand, there are growing examples of church leaders who honor cultural norms uh, over biblical mandates, um, either to appease their community or to reconcile their own same-sex attraction and behavior. And, and neither of those things are good. In fact, a good friend of mine had a torrid time coming to terms with his, his same-sex attraction and his, his faith. Well, why? Because rather than listening to his story and showing him the love of Jesus, his pastor decided instead to open up his Bible to the book of Genesis and systematically work through all the passages about homosexuality in the scriptures. <laughs> it's, it's heartbreaking. In his own words, he would say that he was treated like he had a sickness. This is why I believe that most people who are attracted to the same sex leave the church, not because they're told that same sex behavior is wrong, but because they are coldly and callously judged without any empathy or love. We're talking about people who are created and loved by the God of the universe, the God who is love. We need to repent for things like conversion therapy and for the times that the church has acted harshly or angrily or coldly or judgmentally. And, and we have to look and see all people as those created by God himself. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So before we jump into this next section, let's briefly recap where we've gone so far. Firstly, uh, we have to define terms. Although they're not perfect, 
we are going to separate same-sex attraction and same-sex behavior at this point, because that will become really important later in the discussion. We've defined transgender and intersex, and we've spent a bit of time recognizing that actually, the global church hasn't handled the LGBT discussion particularly well. Although we've rushed through all of this, it's so important that we talk about it, as it will form so much of the foundation that we'll build on in the discussions that will follow. So let's have a quick break, and then we'll add a few biblical foundations that we need in order to continue this conversation. Last week, I had a chat with Simon Argent, um, the, one of the elders at Ascot Life Church in the UK, and uh, he found it funny that I described him as a history scholar, but he is. Um, we talked about the trustworthiness of the Bible, and I highly recommend that if you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, you really need to pause this one and check it out. Go on. I'm waiting. Pause. Go check it out. I'm guessing that you have. It doesn't matter if you haven't. On double speed, it's like 13 minutes, by the way, so you've really got nothing to lose. And here is why. Everything that will follow in this discussion over the next few weeks, well, to be honest, in our entire podcast, is based on the foundational belief that the Bible is the Word of God. That it contains teachings that are crucial to drawing near to Him and honouring the Lord in, in all that we do. And it's the reason that we had that episode last week in preparation for, for this week. Last week, Simon argued that the Bible is trustworthy for three reasons, because it's reliable, because it's relevant, and it's kind of the moral gold standard for humanity. And if you're listening to this podcast, you need to know that this is something that is essential to our faith as hosts of the Simple Faith podcast. It's essential to our faith as husband and wife, and it's essential to our faith as followers of Jesus. So let's, let's be real here. If we truly believe that the God we serve is the God who created the universe with a word, who holds every molecule of creation together with a thought, who knows every detail of everything, who is incomprehensibly powerful or mighty, uh, holy, um, loving, good, all-seeing and all-knowing, which by the way, we totally believe, we think he is all those things. How could the Bible, his very words to his people, to us, how could it not be the final word in, in this discussion? We would be doing a terrible job as servants of an almighty God if we said, oh yeah, well, you know, we think he's, he's pretty powerful, but we don't really actually want to do what he says, right? Like, what kind of testimony is that to an almighty God? So it's really important that as we talk about Bible verses and things like that, that we're clear that there is no room for wiggle room when it comes to the Bible. Like, yes, there's, there's room for interpretation. Yeah, for sure. But if, if something is black and white, it's black and white. The Bible will always win in, in our discussions. Now, you might be thinking, I came here to listen to a talk about LGBT uh, and how the church responds to LGBT. And so you're thinking, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if you are listening and you don't believe in God or you would call yourself a Christian, but you don't believe in the ultimate authority of the Bible as Oh, as the, the divinely inspired word of God, then to be honest, you might not want to listen to the next few episodes. Because of course you're going to disagree with what we'll say, because we don't agree on a basic foundational principle. You know, we're, we're doing our, our very best here not to just tell you what we think because we want to think it. You know, that's not what we're trying to do. We're doing everything we can to, to tell you what the Bible teaches, because for us, that's all that matters. Even when that leads us to difficult conclusions, even when the road it leads to is, is kind of bumpier and rockier and, and more challenging at, at times, it can be downright tough to give an accurate reflection of what the Bible teaches. And we, we know that it can sometimes cause us as believers to say or do things that, that just don't honor the word of God well. But our mission is to look to the Bible alone, not to culture, not to, to pressure, not to our personal preferences, 
Our mission is to look at the Bible alone to arrive at an outcome that honors God. Exactly. Like Dave said, if you don't believe that the Bible is inspired by a perfect and almighty, all-knowing God, then it absolutely makes sense that you wouldn't agree with a lot of what we say because we have very different starting points. But we really believe that there's huge value in listening to people who have different points of view and being open to having those tough discussions. So even if you completely disagree with what we're saying, we really hope that you'll stick around and listen and then share your thoughts with us afterwards because we would love to have those tough conversations and hopefully we can all learn something valuable along the way. So with the time we have left this week, let's finish establishing some foundations. Let's talk about our identity as humans made in the image of God. Yeah, that's a that's a really important step in this process. You know, in in the Western contemporary culture that, that we live in, um, and probably most of you who are listening to this podcast live in, sexual identity is everything, isn't it? There's a, there's a quote from this brilliant book called A Practical Guide to Culture by uh, John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel that I think just nails it. They say that the overwhelming message to kids today is that Christian faith isn't nearly as important as sexual inclinations and attractions. Religious belief is mere personal opinion, but sexuality is definitive, absolute, and unquestionable. Now, you might need to skip back 15 seconds to hear that again, because I think they are on the money. Uh, one friend that I interviewed talked about his, his kind of coming out experience as being the moment that he could finally be who he was supposed to be. And this guy means the world to me. I, I need you to know that. This guy is one of my favorite people in the world but I believe that that statement is false. Let me tell you why. If you're a Christian, you are not defined by your sexuality. I'm going to say that again. If you are a Christian, you are not defined by your sexuality. Straight, lesbian, gay, bisexual, whatever. Yes, your, your sexuality is a part of your identity, but it's a small part. Our primary identity listen to this, our primary identity, the most significant part of our identity, the most beautiful part of our identity is found in the fact that as believers, we are new creations. Uh, Galatians 2.20 says that it's, it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. Paul, who wrote uh, a huge amount of the New Testament, he repeatedly talks about being in Christ. In fact, he uses that, that phrase or something very close to it. I think he uses it over 160 times in his letters. And whether you are a Christian or not, here is a really important truth as well. We are all made in the image of God, regardless of sexuality, gender, race. And you know, we know that in, in these times, it's as important as ever to hear this. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. We're probably familiar with this verse, but listen to this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. This passage is really important. You know, it's so important that even Jesus quotes this passage too, but we'll get to that in a later episode. So what is our identity as humans? Well, it's people made in the image of God. And what is our identity as believers? It's his children of God, co-heirs with Christ. That's huge. We don't have the time to, to dig into that as much as you know, I kind of wish we could, but here's the crucial thing. Sexual orientation is, it is important. Don't mishear me on that. Of course it is. But it is nowhere near as important as our identity as believers. That's what should primarily define us. And we're living in a world where there is so much anger in and outrage, and vitriol, and nastiness. And let's remember that as believers, the most important thing, the most important thing is our foundational relationship with God. And if you are listening to this podcast, you need to know that the God of the Bible, the God of the universe, loves you more than you can possibly know. And you know, the Bible says that we've we've all fallen short of God's like perfect and totally good standards. But but here's the thing. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, the effects of death and what the Bible calls sin, they're conquered. 
And now we can enter into an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father again. All, all we have to do is choose to follow Jesus. And you can know that foundational relationship with God that we're talking about, that thing that is the most important thing. It's, it's a stunning, life-changing, transformational thing. So Shreya, with all that said, maybe it's worth um, summarizing those foundations we've laid one more time. For sure. So we've defined the terms that we'll be using over the next few weeks. We've talked a little bit about how the church really does need to repent for its mishandling of the LGBT discussion on both sides, by the way, how the rest of our conversation will be based on the foundational premise that the Bible is the trustworthy and reliable word of God himself, and how our primary identity is not based on our sexuality. It's part of our identity But if we're followers of Jesus, our primary identity is our status as children of God. Next week, we're talking about sexual intimacy, singleness, and marriage. And although it might seem like we're not getting straight to the point, trust us when we say that these foundations are crucial for week three when we talk about how this all relates to the church and the LGBT community. So this has definitely felt like a heavy air episode and we're conscious of that. But as we've said from the outset, we don't want to hide from difficult conversations just because they're difficult. The problem is when we do that, the only voices that you hear from regularly are the outspoken few on either extreme of the spectrum of discussion. And well, and that's not really a, a healthy thing for anyone, is it? We recognize the challenge here and, and with humility, we hope to rise to it. We want to be authentic. We want to be vulnerable. We want to be honest. And we want to do our best to honor God, even when that conversation. So with all that in mind, thank you so much for sticking with us. Know that we are praying for you. If you're listening to this show, we are praying for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to to message us. Send us a direct message on social media uh, at Simple Faith Podcast. Or you can also head to simplefaithpodcast.com where you can access show notes and uh, you can also contact us there too, by the way. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. Have a great week and we will continue this conversation very soon. Bye.